Today, we are here to learn all about ethics and media. Known for breaking crucial stories about the American automotive bankruptcies, John Stoll currently acts as Detroit's bureau chief at the Wall Street Journal. Now, I also have the pleasure of saying that he was also my professor, and I did get a good grade in his class, so I, I appreciate that as well. <laughs> so without further ado, here's John Stoll. Thanks, DJ. Um, yes, I remember well. It was one of my first classes, so he was kind of a guinea pig for uh, many years to come. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this is, I don't, I really don't do a ton of uh, public events, but uh, this is Rochester and it's my hometown, so uh, here we are. Um, the other venue was New York, so this is much preferred with four kids at home. I'd rather speak in Rochester than New York today. So um, we're going to, just just to kind of overview what's going on, um, I'll go through a few slides and then open it up to questions. Um, and you're welcome to obviously ask anything about the Wall Street Journal or journalism or living in Rochester or, you know, whatever. Automobile industry is fine as well. Um, I also used to cover, uh, the, in Europe, I was stationed in Stockholm. So I, for several years, covered uh, all the Nordics and the Baltics down through a lot of the com countries that are in play now for NATO and with uh, a lot of the discussions about um, Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia, uh, sort of their place in the world, and then down through Poland and Czech Republic. And, and then I also covered the uh, advent of, uh, of, of Pope Francis when he was elected to the papacy. I was there to cover it. So I've seen quite a few things other than autos, but about 15 years of journalism, most of it has been spent in the lovely and, uh, and hallowed grounds of the auto industry. So that's my, my expertise. Journalism and ethics, uh, Father Ken Tanner is here from uh, Holy Redeemer. He says that it's an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> I, I always like to say if I wasn't going to be a journalist, I'd be a priest. My, my approval ratings would be even lower than they are now. <laughs> so it, it, pick your poison. Uh, my dad's a car salesman, so <laughs> one of three ways to go. Uh, I do work for the Wall Street Journal, and so I'm going to do a lot of advertisements tonight uh, for our paper, not because I'm trying to sell them, but it's really the only place I know. So. Um, we are uh, the uh, nation's largest in terms of circulation. We do charge uh, online, which a lot of publications have not been able to do. And uh, we uh, have a growing uh, presence, obviously, in, in uh, places like Washington. But at the moment, we are sort of dialing back some of our coverage overseas. So I'll talk a little bit about why that is and what's going on in the media landscape. I don't want this to be Journalism 101. Um, Gary Gilbert was here last week. He teaches at Oakland. He's my been my boss here for a long time, and he's always uh, helpful for sort of talking about uh, some of the basics of journalism. Um, and you can always take Journalism 200 at, at uh, Oakland, uh, never too late, uh, never too early for, uh, for time at Oakland. But um, I made this slide up today because I was thinking about sort of the way that media has changed and why we're having this discussion uh, at this point in history. Um, and this isn't, isn't um, isn't going to be surprising to anybody. I don't think much of this material is new. It's just maybe the way it's packaged and organized will provoke some thoughts. Um, up in the far left corner is the public house. And really, um, at the beginning of our nation, uh, this was really the way that ideas were exchanged. And there was a lot of gathering in public houses. And people had more time. Uh, the industrial age did not come. And so folks were gathering a lot more, not to say that they had all kinds of disposable time. People were obviously working very hard. But this, is what, this was, you know, the cable news of their day was, was around the table over a pint of something and food. And, and so with, with the proliferation of newspapers, this was uh, our first Wall Street Journal from the 1880s. Um, hopefully nobody remembers it. But uh, this is uh, on my wall at my office. And it's always a good remembrance that this was really the time when, when, when newspapers were becoming more uh, common, more of a, a common um, method for organizing the agenda. And, and that's what the news media has always at least thought that we did, was, was tried to organize the news into a palatable agenda and, and tried to hand it off to readers in, a, in an organized form so that what's on the front page is of most importance and maybe what's buried inside is in, of interest to fewer readers, but it's still worth being in the newspaper. It's always been coveted by, I, by journalists such as myself to be on the front page because above the fold, is, is, this was a tabloid, but you know what would come is you fold your newspaper and you want to be above the fold, obviously, on the front page. And uh, it's, it's great walking through airports and seeing your name on the newspaper. But for a long time, this was the, the big way that people were consuming their news. And then, obviously, Walter Cronkite came along and the, 
the, uh, the television changed uh, the cycle. The cycle became shorter. People were tuning in, tuning in more often for more updates. So where you had the extra version of a newspaper maybe late in the day that would give you the updates on, on the news. Um, now you had the 6 o'clock, the 5 o'clock, the, the 9 o'clock news in the morning. So the, and the 11 o'clock news at night, you know, people like Bill Bonds were giving you more news um, in shorter formats, in more palatable formats, and a lot of times the, the invention of the rip and read came where they'd pull something out of the newspaper and they'd, they'd read it on air and then they'd move on to the next idea. Um, and then we have the lovely cable news, which was brought to you by CNN in the 1980s and uh, has just blown up. Uh, and that has changed dramatically your perception of what the media does and who the media are. Um, with Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man on television, you sort of put your faith in what Walter Cronkite was saying was not only true, but it was fair, balanced. And when he got on the air and interrupted uh, broadcast in the 1960s to tell people that JFK had been shot, it's real news, OK? He's not just going to get on. Um, it, some of you may have been watching Monday Night Football when Har Howard Cosell got on and, and broke into uh, uh, a discussion about John Lennon's death. Again, a trusted voice, a trusted medium. You could, you could bank on 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 you know these news alerts being, being accurate and and them not wasting your time. And so it was a more organized uh, life. People had less time to consume news, um, and and really were tuned in at specific times, to check in at 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 appointed hours. And and somebody like me would bring it to you and say, here's the agenda for the evening, and this is what's on the on the plate. And if it was left out, there weren't a lot of other places to get media. So you really relied on the Wall Street Journal or Channel 2 or the Detroit News or Oakland Press to bring you the local news and to tell you what you needed to care about. And going outside of those uh, uh, arenas was very hard for a long time. And then with the 24-hour news cycle and O.J. Simpson and all of the things that kind of created, uh, and obviously the 92 campaign and 96 campaign, this began to snowball. And Folks who we thought were not journalists and somehow became bunched in with the people that were trained as journalists, and the media became a very broad concept. And ironic, not ironically, the trust in media began to go down, and the war uh, between factions um, and our reliance on media that we thought agreed with us grew because the availability of media uh, exploded. Uh, everyone, you know, as we adopt cable television, the Fox News and the CNN and the MSNBC and the CNBC. They just began to grow, and court TV. And so the places where you could get information and opinion changed. So now, rather than a person like myself spending time on an article, which was in, you know, organized in a certain way, to bring you quotes in context, I quote George Jeffrey Figer in a story about Jack, Jack Kevorkian. I do it in context to try to tell you the whole story and to deliver you the opposing viewpoint as well, to balance it out, right, to be fair. To give both sides, <clears throat> you know, obviously Jeff Figer is incentivized to believe a certain thing, and then there's another side that believes differently than Jack Kevorkian did. Uh, when, 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 uh, when, when Jeff Figer can go on Fox News or Greta Van Susteren or Court TV or MSNBC and speak unfiltered for 15 minutes, our consumption of media and news changes because there's nothing to balance that out anymore. So that's the lovely thing that happened to us in the 80s and 90s. And then um, the internet. This is my favorite cartoon ever. Uh, it's a New Yorker cartoon. I blew it up because it's hard to see it on the bottom. <laughs> uh, I love the New Yorker, not, because, not necessarily because of the content, but because of the cartoons. Um, I mean, who knows who's writing this stuff these days, right? And uh, I love dogs. And I think our, my dog's smarter than many of the media. Um, and so I'm OK with this cartoon. But it's a great little trick that this dog, <laughs> the dog teaches the other dog, which is, look, you know, nobody knows you're a dog on, on, online. And nobody knows who you are when you begin to sort of generate news. And I, and I don't have the slides to show you that Twitter and Facebook and, and, and Instagram and all these things have taken over our lives. But we all know that the news cycle has been in, you just shortened to 60 seconds a minute. Yesterday, you know, we were talking about Syria. Today, we're talking about United Airlines. And in the middle of talking about United Airlines, now we're talking about uh, Sean Spicer and his completely off-base <laughs> remarks about the Holocaust. And so that will change in the next six you know, hours or five minutes or 20, 20 hours. The, the whole, you know, a lot of us were in the media who are producers of media 
um, we're saying thank God for United Airlines. I mean, we finally get to write about and talk about something that is not Donald Trump and not Washington. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> his spokesman steps up and makes, makes some pretty interesting comments. But uh, the important thing is anybody with, uh, with a computer, with, uh, with a thought, can, can get it out there. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's the democratization of ideas. People have a platform to say what they want. We're, we're much more exposed today in 2017 to a diversity of thought and, a diver and, and the problems in the world than we were in when Cronkite's day. Because there was only so much bandwidth and there were only so many people, and most of the people that were doing the news generation and gathering looked the same. Um, so we have had a lot of diversity come into the media and a lot of diversity of thought and a lot of new ideas and a lot of new information, which is a great thing, but we don't always know where that's coming from. Um, and that is a problem and that's kind of why we've sort of entered into a new focus on fake news. Now, I know, I don't know how much of this was billed as fake news, but I know there's a commitment in Rochester to kind of not proliferate on, on our social webs, um, fake news, but you know, any, anybody who studies history knows that we had yellow journalism in the 1800s. It's not a new phenomenon, but it's just in our face. And what I would say this has done, and nobody, nobody's really on the computers anymore, we're all on our smartphones, but it, it has not changed the divisiveness in our country. It has not changed the fact that we have differing sides on the media. If you look at, you know, the 1800s, I mean, there are some pretty, I mean, they used to, you know, shoot each other in the streets over arguments. So we've, you know, in Rochester that doesn't happen much, but um, <laughs> hey, we could use a little more of it maybe. Uh, but um, what has happened is it's raised the anxiety level because we're all married to our smartphones and we're all sitting here looking at this all the time. And, we, and so the, the media, we specialize in world is falling, half glass empty stuff. That's what we do, that's what we sell. And it's a great business because people want to buy it. They just continue to just lap this stuff up. But when that's all we know, that's all we sort of begin to think about, the anxiety level raises. And then we begin sus became, becoming suspicious of one another and we're afraid to say who we voted for. Um, so this is really hard to read, uh, and I understand. I'm not going to make you guys try to read it. I'm going to read it for you. But this is Walter Williams. Uh, he is uh, well known as uh, you all know who Walter Williams is. Not not Walter White from Breaking Bad, but Walter Williams, uh, who has um, gone on to the great newsroom in the sky. But before he departed, he he wrote a very important uh, memorandum on what journalism it is, and it remains kind of the cornerstone for Columbia and Min Missouri, which is one of the better known journalism schools. And I'm going to read it for you because it had, I mean, I, I read this to my journalism classes and they all just yawn and like they fall asleep, but this is the first thing that I read to them and they're like, this is going to be a great class. Uh, but I think, I think it's interesting to go back because most of us as, J as J school students needed to read this, memorize it, we were quizzed on it. And what he said was, I believe that the public journal is a public trust that all connected with it are, to the full measure of responsibility, trustees for the public, that all acceptance of lesser service than, than the public service is a betrayal of this trust. I believe that clear thinking, clear statement, accuracy, and fairness are fundamental to good jur journalism. I believe that a journalist should write only what he holds in his heart to be true. I believe that suppression of news for any consideration other than the welfare of society is indefensible. I believe that no one should write as a journalist what he would not say as a gentleman, that bribery by one's own pocketbook is as much to be avoided as bribery by the pocketbook of another, that individual responsibility may not be escaped by pleading another's instructions or another's dividends. I believe the supreme t test of good journalism is the measure of its public service. I believe that the journalism which succeeds the best and best deserves success fears God and honors man, is stoutly independent, unmoved by pride of opinion or greed of power, constructive, tolerant, but never careless, self-controlled, patient, always respectful to its readers, but always unafraid, is quickly indignant at injustice, is unswayed by the appeal of privilege or the clamor of the mob, seeks to give every man a chance and as far as law, an honest wage and recognition of human brotherhood can make it so an equal chance, is profoundly patriotic while sincerely promoting international goodwill and cementing world, com world com comradeship is a journalism of humanity of and for today's world. So a lot of ideals, I, yeah, I would, I, 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 I think that's a lot to accomplish in a, in a career if you, if you attempt it, but it, it really should be the sort of the determining factor. So um, it, it's sort of the foundation of, of what we believe to be legitimate newsrooms is that we're not accepting uh, freebies. We're not taking, uh, you know, lavish trips 
and I cover the auto industry, and the auto industry is well known for the junkets that they provide for the media. We don't take them, we pay them back. If we go somewhere with the automaker, we write a check. Uh, if I cover Trump and I cover the election and I'm flying all over the world on, on Air, Air Trump, I'm, I'm writing a check and paying them back. Um, that's one example, but it goes way deeper than that. Obviously, this is an ethic, and ethics are at the core of our profession. It's a lot different than advertising, marketing, uh, public relations. Not that those aren't ethical professions and there's not an ethic to them, but this is one that is about being a public trust. And it's a conflict in an era when public comp when, when media organizations are public companies. So the New York Times is owned by a family. For a long time, the Wall Street Journal was owned by a family. For a long, long time, the Washington Post was owned by a family. But increasingly now, we're owned by News Corp. The Wall Street Journal is owned by Rupert Murdoch's companies. Uh, while, uh, Washington Post is owned by the owner of, is, of Amazon. Uh, the New York Times remains a, uh, a, uh, a family-owned company, but there's a lot of pressure on them to uh, earn a profit and to earn a, a, a to d deliver to shareholders. So those are a lot increasingly in conflict with one another, particularly in an age when a NBC and 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 we're going up against um, BuzzFeed. We're going up against all kinds of publications that don't necessarily come from this school. And I'm not saying MSNBC or, or BuzzFeed don't, but we are going up against a lot of, of organizations that don't come from the same legacy that we do. And so uh, there is a bit of a clash there. And, I, and, and it's a good thing and a bad thing. So we'll get into some of the goods and bads. Um, sure I didn't miss anything. So if this is true, you'd think, wow, these guys are really Honest dealers, man. I mean, I can trust. I can trust <laughs> these guys. If they if they uphold, you know, Walt Walt Williams' ideals, then we have nothing to worry about. But public trust in the media is at an all-time low. Um, this is a Gallup poll that was widely circulated very recently, and basically what it tells us is 20% of the people think that we're um, that they have a great deal of confidence in what we do, uh, or quite a lot. Whereas 36% say they don't have any confidence in the media. Um, and in newspapers in particular. So this is not the mass media. This is newspapers in particular where there has been uh, historically more credibility in the newspapers than there is on you know, uh, squawk boxes and, and talking heads on cable television. So this is, a, this is a trend we don't like, particularly those of us who are married to the newspaper business, um, because it, it, trust is, a, is our only currency. That's it, is that you believe what you read, that we're telling you the truth. If we're not doing that, we really don't have a reason to be in business. Um, be what, what, uh, what institution in society would have a better record than this? Well, the medical profession is one. Um, pharmacists, police officers, clergy, uh, bankers. Um, who would have wor worst are lawyers, congressmen, car salesmen, and um, Advertising practitioners. I, I give I give my dad a hard time because if I hadn't been a journalist, I'd be a car salesman. It goes way back in the family. Um, but yeah, it it, it 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 the numbers are hard to. They do one of the things about any chart that a journalist learns is there's a lot of there's a lot of points in history where, in fact, in 2001, um, you had a a, a a a huge faith in the media. Well, what happened in 2001, right? You know, there was a lot of harmony and you know hegemony in society, and everyone rallied together. So a lot of this is when these polls were taken. But clearly, the last election didn't really help anybody. So um, this is trust in mass media uh, by age. So you're going to blow it up quite a bit to look at a lot of the other sites that we kind of uh, exchange on Facebook and things, um, and Bill O'Reilly and Rachel Maddow and such. And again, uh, people older than 50 uh, have a better view. Uh, of us than people under 50, and it makes a lot of sense uh, given uh, many of the folks my age grew up in homes where parents and grandparents were becoming more disillusioned with the media and becoming more discriminating in the way that they consume media and had more options so they could turn the channel. Um, this doesn't help. Brian Williams, the new Con Walter Cronkite, Cronkite doesn't help. What, what he is, if you missed it, you know, former NS NBC anchor. It gets caught up in lying. Um, it much more damaging than Stephen Glass or some of the other newspaper magazine guys that got into trouble is when a Brian Williams figure just can't be trusted. It's a little sticky. Um, this also doesn't help. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I'm an equal opportunity disliker of cable news. But um, Rachel Maddow's 
sort of moment in the sun in the last couple months, weeks, was when she got the, you know, allegedly the 2005 uh, tax return of Trump, which it was, and they confirmed it was. But they made a really big deal out of this, and um, their their ratings for the first time in history were higher than CNN's, uh, but not, you know, which means they weren't the worst in the industry. Uh, and uh, uh, this this is the kind of gotcha stuff that people are just tired of. They're really tired of picking up the newspaper, and and Trump is, you know, or Clinton are blamed for all of our our problems, or turning on NPR and another story about how, you know, the 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 politicians in Washington are all our problems, and so there's this disconnect between what we really care about in real life, which I'm sure plenty of people in here care about Trump's tax returns, but at the end of the day, our lives go on if we don't know what he made in 2005, um, and not not to. Um, you know, underplay the importance of a president being completely transparent and disclosive in their financial transactions, but they laid dollar short on this story and way over promised on what she had. Uh, Bill O'Reilly doesn't help. Um, I'm a fan of Bill O'Reilly's articulation. He's a very clear, strong communicator. His politics aside, regardless of how you feel about them, he has built an incredible empire and solidified a uh, followership that no one in media has ever done. And he has created an empire in Fox News. And so as a businessman and a communicator, he's very effective. But there has been this really ugly trail for about 10 years of allegations aimed at Bill O'Reilly that are beginning to really peck away at his credibility. So not only is it Rachel Maddow on the extreme left, it's Bill O'Reilly on the extreme right. And this stuff just seesaws through history. Who knows who it will be next? And this happens with our politicians. What, w the problem is, is that we view these folks as hardcore journalists. And they're, they're in the art of, they're in the business of disseminating opinion and having very strong views on things. And sometimes, you know, as Bill O'Reilly says, he's looking out for you and he's bringing you thoughts, or M Rachel Maddow is bringing you thoughts that the mainstream media either doesn't have the credibility or have the sources to bring you. And, and so they're going to say stuff that we in, the, we in the real journalism community really can't do. Um, and then our president has uh, stoked the flames. Uh, whether you agree with him or not, he has created a divide between uh, the traditional institutional incumbent media and the public uh, by using very loaded and explosive terminology such as uh, the, now the Wall Street Journal hasn't been called out, so I guess I, I can kind of stand on a, a different ground. I, you know, we, we feel like we're bunched into this. He hasn't called out the Wall Street Journal ever uh, because we obviously have a very right-leaning editorial page. Um, but we have been very tough on Donald Trump as a publication, and he has called us out in press conferences for being fake news. But he hasn't done it on Twitter or in print. But this is a real, many journalists see this as a big problem, and the fact that 150,000 of his followers liked it indicates that there's a lot of um, sol solidarity with the president in terms of his view that the failing, uh, which he's right, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, all of us are failing business models. You can't get outside of the fact that we are not as successful as Trump Tower or Mar-a-Lago or any of these, these companies that he has today. But at the same time, we'll get into why, uh, why I, that's not necessarily the case that we are the enemy of the American people. We're always going to be at, at odds with the mainstream thought on certain things, but uh, I take issue with that. So this is not new. Presidents have been, I mean, many of us know that presidents have had a long uh, disruptive relationship with the news media. We'll get to Richard Nixon in a minute. But uh, Jefferson was a big advocate of new newspapers. As you can see, the basis of our governments being the opinion of the people. The very first object should be to keep that right. And if it were left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. And then the newspapers uh, felt that his whip, uh, 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 as President Jefferson saw newspaper, uh, newspapers abuse their freedom and publish lies about gossip, this obviously colored his view. And after leave, leaving uh, the, the White House, and he was beaten up by, by the press, he remained an advocate of the press. Um, FDR, in the 1940s, um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, set up the ill-fated Office of Censorship. Uh, Nixon, okay. It goes without saying that he had a, a rather contentious uh, relationship with the media. Um, reminds me of Steve, Steve Jokic, if you remember that name from the UAW, just to, you know, always at war with the media, and it's always the media's fault. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, refused to allow the press, the press access to a mil military operation in the Caribbean. Caribbean, that was a big inflection point in terms of access. And in 1985, he traded missiles for hostages, and that became you know, a big, giant media kerfuffle. Um, 
and it's not just uh, Republicans. Bill Clinton, he had a way of blaming all of many of his own self-induced problems on right-wing extremist conspiracies. And uh, George W. Bush had his own moments as well, and so did uh, Barack Obama. Um, he he de definitely promised a transparent administration, but uh, most of his critics would say the transparency was not forthcoming. Um, to sort of speed us along, where, where are we at? So I'm going to get into a little bit about why, why this advocacy for hardcore journalism. Yesterday, you may have seen the Pulitzer Prizes come out. Why do we rally around the winners of Pulitzer Prizes, um, and why are certain you know publications always locked out of them? Um, it's not because uh, they're 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 not allowed to win. It's because they don't produce the kind of journalism that we see is in in in, in the interest of public service, and that's really an important difference between. Um, much of the media that we see that's produced, either you know the companies are providing and the politicians are saying stuff, and we're just re reiterating what they're saying. But this is this is where journalism goes a step further, and begins to do things that aren't necessarily sanctioned by the White House or sanctioned by the mayor of Rochester or sanctioned by, you know, you name the company, Ford Motor Company, but that need to be done. They're in the public interest, and a lot of times, being you know the the big con the big tension has been that when you're a publicly traded for-profit institution, obviously you have more resources to do that. Hopefully you have deeper pockets at that point, but you also have the tension of saying, well, now we have to do things that are in interest of our shareholders. So it begins to dilute the pool in terms of what, what your real intentions are. But the First Amendment, we all know it well. Uh, obviously it, it, it establishes respect for a few things, but among them, is uh, is a, a, a prohibition about abr abridging the freedom of speech or the press uh, or the right of people to peacefully assem assemble or to petition government for redress on, of grievances. And the First Amendment is not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. Uh, it's you know definitely under attack at certain times from both sides. I think a lot of folks that uh, have things that are not uh, traditionally thought of as being uh, uh, under attack from the Freedom of Speech Act uh, now these days say, I, I can't really speak my mind. If I was to say my mind and the things that I think, uh, I would get, you know, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people felt like if, even if you said you supported Trump during the election, that you'd be, you know, put up on a cross because it was just completely, you know, uh, uh, out of fashion with, with uh, mainstream thought or whatever, you know, you were kind of looked at as being weird or something. And so, but you're allowed to do that in our society and, and we are protected to say what we, we feel we need to say. And that it particularly comes down to a protection that, it's the only protection that really keeps us in business, is to be able to take on administrations. Woodward and Bernstein were able to do what they were allowed to do because they are protected by the Constitution. Um, now, this I borrowed some of these slides from Gary Gilbert at Oakland University, so they're, they're aimed at, a, um, at, at kids just coming out of high school. But um, my love for dogs kind of showed through on this one. A news media that is, not f that is free to investigate and criticize the government is absolutely essential in a nation that practices self-government and is therefore dependent on an educated and enlightened citizenry. citizenry. Um, this is the most important slide that I'll probably show you tonight. This is in Syria, and this is a, these, were, these pictures were captured on April 7th, and they moved the president to change his mind on certain policies aimed at uh, Assad and what's going on with the gassing of people there. And whether you agree with it or not, there's been a change in policy. It's clear, you know, Trump went from black to white on a certain issue. And I, he will say that, I changed my mind. And the thing that changed his mind was not some well thought out lobbyist or a congressman or it was the pictures that were brought to you by the media. And so this could change Syria so the freedom, the international freedom of press sort of ideal could have lasting effects in Syria because there were pictures to prove something. A lot of people still deny some things that happened in the 1940s or deny the, uh, the, the problems of slavery. Well, if they had the kind of microphone that Twitter and Facebook and the Wall Street Journal give us today, maybe they w those atrocities would have been better, better viewed. Um, and this is the real time uh, effects and devastation of weapons of mass destruction used on a more limited scale, but killing dozens of people. And so this moved to immediate action, and obviously um, this is a, a big debate, what do we do next? But it clearly changed the mind of the president, and that's the power of the press. 
Um, it's not always the best relationship. It's not always done for the right reasons. A lot of times the press can inadvertently or even advertently manipulate uh, outcomes. But in this case, um, the desired effect is, on the press's case, is to show what's going on in the world and hope for positive change. Um, the freedom of, of the press, so in, 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 in Syria's case, if, if our goal was a more free society, uh, a free press uh, would have a huge effect here. For democracy to flourish, it must uh, live in an environment that fosters the free exchange of information and ideas, and I would say imagery. Um, Reuters, AFP, uh, organizations that exist to take pictures of what's going on in the real world uh, is, again, to President Trump in the Rose Garden tells the media, the pictures changed my mind. I feel differently about the Assad regime today than I did before he did this. And we all know that uh, Trump's a very visual guy, uh, not unlike many of us who, you know, take in real pictures much differently than maybe we, we, we would consume a white paper on a certain issue. Problem points for the media and how, how, why we're in this kind of stage that we're in today, which is not unlike other stages in history. Um, one is, well, let me just back up a little bit. It's always been a problem that the real news is hard to decipher from what we would call fake news. And this goes back to uh, the yellow uh, press, yellow journalism, um, big problem during the Roosevelt years and even before. Uh, this is just one example of, of, a, of a widely uh, uh, discussed case of, of why Roosevelt wants to go and, and blow people up and, and whether, or not, uh, whether or not the news behind it was real or not. And it, it's it, a lot of misinformation coming out for a lot of different reasons, but most of it, uh, uh, in, in, in most of it is fueled by partisanship and, uh, and, and racism and or just you know, ideas that were, were, were not in step with reality. So the yellow press has existed a long time, and before that, the stifling ideas before Martin Luther and, and the printing press, obviously there wasn't even the ability of people to know what was going on in their world. So with the advent of, with, with, with the, with the um, growth in literacy and the advent of newspapers, you're going to have misinformation. You're gonna peop people are going to take advantage of that all the time and take advantage of the platform that they have. Um, a very busy slide from our own newspaper. Uh, another problem that the media has historically is that in newspapers, magazines, and these are the formats where you really feel like people sit down and consume 700,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 words on an issue, the, the, the ad spending is declining significantly. We had a 25% decline in one quarter about a year ago at the Wall Street Journal and it led to mass layoffs and that really restricts our ability to do what we want to do which is send people all over the world and use the access that we have to get to places where no one else uh, is going. And so much of that is moving to uh, mediums that are not journalistically motivated, outdoor advertising's at the bottom, that's pretty flat, but you see TVs going way up, far more being pumped into uh, entertainment uh, and or cable news. Uh, and then digital is through the roof. Digital is obviously the big problem for our industry as we're trying to wrestle with that. But there's less money for what we want to do, more journalism, less money is a problem. Uh, another one is just everybody's a journalist because everyone has a smartphone. This is the United Isle from a couple days ago where they dragged somebody off the plane. We've all been on planes in very uncomfortable situations. We've, we've all had situations where it's like, I'm glad I'm not that guy or I am that guy and I get kicked off a plane for some reason or the, and, 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 and very, and if somebody would document this, you know, maybe I'd get my justice. Well, this happened the other day and regardless of how you feel about the passenger and whether he should have gotten off or not gotten off, he was taken off by some pretty extreme force and there were cuts and contusions and Twitter posts and all kinds of things to make, you know, to put United in, in a problem spot. Well, it didn't take a high-powered news organization to break this one open. It took somebody with a, with a smartphone to take a picture and disseminate it and then it got around real fast. And again, that's a problem if you've invested heavily into the institution and then you're getting schooled by a five-year-old with a smartphone. Now this was a, an older person, but anybody can do this stuff these days. And the imagery, again, is powerful. Uh, this is the big one. Um, this is uh, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, uh, not Robert Redford and, and uh, uh, who's <laughs> Dustin Hoffman. Uh, although they, they were great, uh, Dustin Hoffman, he, he is a ringer for Dustin Hoffman. I don't know about Robert Redford and Bob Woodward, but um, I look more like Robert Redford, I think. But um, <laughs> the, uh, 
um, the problem here that I want to get to is sourcing and anonymous sourcing and the uh, continuing rally on unna uh, rail uh, railing on unnamed sources. Um, I wrote a lot about General Motors based on unnamed sources that they were going bankrupt and that the government needed to kind of think differently than, than some of the lobbyists in the Detroit think tanks were telling them to think because we were going to spend a lot of money on something that maybe, you know, could have been done differently. And um, there were a lot of unnamed sources, a lot of people that would not put their names in the newspaper. Deep Throat wasn't known, Mark Felt wasn't known until Mark Felt died. So we don't have, now, Watergate probably would have been brought to the fore by the, maybe would have been brought to the fore by the FBI you know, without Mark Felt leaking to Woodward and Bernstein, but maybe not. And that was a lot of Felt's, you know, ambition, obviously. We're a little bit uh, of sour grapes for not becoming the head of the FBI, but also wanted to accelerate things that were being uh, capped by the Nixon administration. The Nixon administration had power to tell the FBI not to do something and, and, and send people on wild goose chases and do all the bureaucracy to just slow down this never happens, right? To slow down uh, investigations. And Woodward and Bernstein accelerated it, but they were unnamed sources. And this was a real problem in the 1970s because have we heard this recently? Like, you got all these people that won't put their names behind it. Of course they're not going to put their names behind it because they're the deputy director of the, of the FBI. Um, and so this is a conflict that we have not only with people in power, but our readers, because our readers often get frustrated with the fact that we rely very heavily. When it becomes abused, and it has become abused, but when it becomes abused, it becomes a nuisance for the reader. The reader feels ripped off because they feel like everything coming to them is based on people who won't put their names to it. So in journalism schools, what, they, what we do teach is avoid anonymous sourcing at any point you can. Try to push people to go on the record. And if you ever read All the President's Men or A Secret Man by Bob Woodward, you'll, you'll hear his, 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 his real conviction to try to make Mark Felt go on the record, and he won't. But um, we don't, again, we don't have that coverage if it's not for anonymous sources. Falling Man. This is a real disturbing picture from 9-11. And it's a problem for the, for the media because we still do have a self-censorship button that we have to push. And there came a point on 9-11 where the rest of the world saw a lot more people jumping to their death than America did. And I don't know if you've ever, there's a great Esquire piece on, on this picture and many, 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 many others that were distributed by the international media that gratefully in the United States as we were watching the coverage, we were not subject to this. And the reason was, was it, enough was enough. We did not need to see our own people jumping out of buildings to, to underscore the fact that this was a complete tragedy and a, and a crisis in America. And, not, and, and there's, a, there, there's still a debate to this day whether this picture should have gotten the kind of celebration that it did because it's a defeat picture and there's a family behind this and there's controversy even who it is. Um, and the family who they think they've identified who, who the man is says that can't be, he would never jump out of the building. So we do have this button that we should be a uh, prudence. Uh, we need to be more prudential oftentimes in the way that we approach what we cover, what we say, when we say it, how we say it. Um, the panic button is just, we, we hit it so fast in the media today because it sells clicks and it gets us advertisers and it boosts traffic. And I, I hate to think in 2017 how differently we might have treated 9-11 if it had been done 16 years later. Okay, so um, there was a point where the American media said, enough is enough, we're going we're gonna to stop showing this imagery. And reading, I, I'd encourage you guys, there's an Esquire piece, do an Esqu uh, word, uh, a Google search on Esquire Falling Man. And it's a powerful story about some of the sounds and the images that accompanied 9-11 that I was never aware of until this story came out and the photographer was willing to tell the story. And the last problem we have, and this is a big one, is the war between real media and talking heads. And I am not, like I said, I'm not here to bash Fox. I work for the company that you know produces Fox. Fox probably pay, you know, is the one that actually pays my salary because the Wall Street Journal doesn't make much money. Um, God bless these folks. They're not journalists, and they're part of the part of the problem that we have in the uh, perception of the media. They have a place, Glenn Beck, uh, Chris Matthews, um, on down the line. They have a place, they have a role uh, that they play. Um, but one of the problems is that people turn this on or they turn on the alternative on the left and they think, well, okay, everything but this opinion that's being put out there is in opposition to 
uh, to what I believe, and therefore we're at war. And so, obviously, <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we are very divided as a nation, and this stuff is disseminated and begins to become the germs, oftentimes, for fake news because the guy in the suspenders got himself in some trouble, and so did another guy in Fox News for saying things that weren't true. And then they get disseminated as true, and it happens all the time. It's not, again, I, I do not think that I'm sitting here picking on Fox News. It, it happens on all, Keith Oberman, everybody. They throw things out there, they have people on, they say things, they aren't fact-checked, they aren't uh, balanced with another opinion, they aren't uh, given the proper context and the analysis that the journalist is supposed to give them, and, and it becomes our reality, unfortunately. And now, this is an extreme, and this is, not a, this is not a comment about President Trump's character, but what we've seen the trend to be is President Trump will watch a show at, in the morning that happens to be on this network, and he will tweet out what they say as if it was fact. Um, and so then the media is forced to write stories that are prefaced with, without, um, without uh, giving any proof, President Trump said Tuesday X, Y, and Z. Without giving any proof, President Trump said Wednesday X, Y, and Z. And um, it's created the kind of cycle that we're in, uh, it, or par partially. Uh, so this is just a couple things that it, journalists, re when you're sort of trying to decipher, okay, you know, is this publication, is this outlet telling me the, just the facts? You know, the thing that I tell my journalism students is just tell me what happened. That's it. And I tell my kids the same thing. I don't want to know how the sausage is made. Just tell me what happened. That's it. Vaughn, tell me what happened. Jack, tell me what happened. I'll get two sides of the story, and then I'll try to figure it out. Um, that's really the media's job. Tell me what happened, okay? Leave the adverbs, the drama, the, 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 the flowery language to other people. Just tell me what happened or tell me what, 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 what we think is going to happen. Uh, the common criticism is that there's too much bias in the what happened category. Um, not in the Fox News talking heads category, but that it's begun to seep into what you're picking up the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and saying these guys are biased and they are out to tear down a certain candidate. They are out to tear down a certain way of life. One of the big newspapers in town that is not, or in New York, that is not the Wall Street Journal took extreme criticism for this during the election for actually almost all but saying, do not vote for a certain candidate. And they came back with a mea culpa later and said, we need to reevaluate the way we do journalism. It's just a step too far for our profession. Because when, when bias is naked and blind, I mean, look, I'm a biased person. I have my biases. I have my, I love my favorite cars, my favorite car companies, my favorite executives. And, and that's just my thing. If it starts to show up in the coverage, they have a right to complain. What was that you What's that? The, the, uh, New York Times. Yeah, yeah. You can find Dean, Dean Biquette's uh, sort of mea culpa online where he said we went a little far. Um, Reuters had a, Reuters, which is a big giant news organization, um, had a moment that they tried to preempt this. Stephen Adler, their, uh, their CEO, their president of the newsroom, came out and tried to get in front of it by giving an edict on what straight news looks. So it's really interesting to look at Dean Biquette, Jerry Baker from our publication put stuff out. He's my boss. And then um, Stephen Adler from Reuters all had different views on how we approach this. The bottom line with all of it was fair, accurate, straight, balanced, relevant news and trying to get both sides of the story. Now, I know many of you are like, yeah, right, it doesn't happen, it's all, it all sounds good. Um, and then the conflicts of interest thing. If, 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 if things look like they're just laden with conflicts of interest, uh, it's a big red flag. Um, my favorite slide and the last one is our friend Kwame Kilpatrick. And so this city was stocked with Kwame supporters. Um, who did not look like your typical St uh, Kwame supporters for a long time. They were diehard fans, and for good reason. Very charismatic guy, came with the promise of a lot of change, had a lot of energy. Um, at the beginning of his administration, seemed to be the guy that was going to clean up some of the legacy problems that Detroit had. They stuck with him, they stuck with him, they stuck with him. The media began to really dig in early, and then increasingly aggressive getting in, in Kwame's stuff, right? And they'd go, on, they'd go to Hawaii, and, and, and Kwame was there on the city's dime, and he'd be like, oh, just leave me alone. Or he'd you know, be somewhere, and, and the, the most egregious was Steve Wilson. Anybody remember Steve Wilson from Channel 7? Not, not many, uh, much remembered, not much liked. Steve was a pain in the rear, and, reader, and, 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 and not many viewers really liked him, but Steve was always there. And who? In, in, in his, you know, what, is, <laughs> what does hindsight tell us about that combative relationship? And Kwame always saying, you're on a witch hunt. 
get away from me. I'm just trying to do the city's work. I mean, history tells us that, right, that, that age-old conflict between the free press and Kwame Kilpatrick once again fell on the side of the press. Now, it doesn't always happen, but typically, if standards are applied correctly, uh, you'll get the public interest to come through and the right guy to get thrown in jail and the money to be paid back, hopefully. Now, it doesn't always happen, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are times when the press is restricted, um, particularly when the right to a free trial uh, is, a, is a judge's uh, jurisdiction on that. Uh, the right to enjoy a good reputation. Obviously, we can't just say what we want to say sometimes about people, even though it's become more nasty. Uh, the right to be left alone, the right to privacy. Uh, there's a big documentary right now, a big controversy around a documentary, whatever happened to Richard Simmons. Like, if you haven't noticed, Richard Simmons has been off the planet for about a year and a half. Nobody's heard from him. And he used to be the most out there public guy, hey, how you doing, encouraging people to lose weight and exercise. He's nowhere to be found. And a lot of people are telling the podcast producers, let it go. He has a right to privacy. Quit trying to get him to come out of his house. Um, and obviously, the press is the biggest uh, uh, um, offender in this area. We know that they, we like to show up on front lawns and ask people how they felt after their loved one dies and stuff like that. But there is a right to be left alone, and there is a right to sue in those circumstances. And then there is a right to profit from one's creations. Um, that's that's, uh, that's obviously protected uh, increasingly by intellectual property um, rights and libel and uh, plagiarism. So that's my presentation for tonight. Um, I've got many more slides that I've got printed out that I could keep talking if you want me to. But I know a lot of folks come with a lot of, thank you very much, uh, a lot of folks come with a lot of questions. And so I'll open it up. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Face the Nation, Meet the Press. Tim Russert was one of my heroes before he t passed away. He was very fair. Uh, a lot of times, uh, you, when you went on Meet the Press, you were not surprised that you were going to get grilled and you were going to get your own statements to come back and haunt you. And so uh, the, um, the Sunday shows, in my view, we still, we still write a lot from the Sunday shows because uh, politicians, business people, uh, civic leaders, religious leaders, folks who are in the spotlight for better or worse like a platform where they can answer themselves. And they don't need somebody like me answering for them. So we had a big conflict during the bank bankruptcy where uh, I went and covered the GM CEO in Washington. And I knew what was going on behind the scenes because I had really good sources. And I had been writing what was going on the scenes because I had really good sources. And I knew why the s CEO at a breakfast with media and other constituents answered a question like he did. And so I wrote the story straight. This is, well, the company had big problems with that. And they blogged about it. Um, back then, they had a corporate blog. And the, you know, the, the CEO has a right to do that. And he said, John, John's a reporter that never lets the facts get in the way of a good story. And uh, he's right. But uh, I. I, that was their right, but what they'd rather have is the is the platform to just be able to say it themselves and be able to to answer the criticism, and Face the Nation and the Sunday shows often do that. Now there is going to be a break from that where the pundits sit around Peggy Noonan and Bob Seifert and Schiefer and all the others who talk about you know what what's important to them and and that's all fine and dandy and and most of the time those are informed discussions. Um, and a lot of times there's a lot more information than we'd ever have access to. I mean, that's one of the powers of the media and why when you get journalists to sit on panels or even, you know, columnists to sit on panels, um, there's a lot of value in that because we do have access to information that most of the public don't have just because of the nature of our jobs. And we have that kind of, you know, relationship with the power brokers, whether they're the companies, the politicians, where they'll talk to us or people around them will talk to us. So most of the time, even though we have to be oftentimes hedged in how we answer a question or we have to make sure that we're, we're not going overboard, we're, we're, we're giving you what we know to be the truth. And so there's also value in those sort of powwows that happen on the sidelines. But the biggest one is when Hillary Clinton sits down with, you know, whoever the moderator is and, and the moderator, you know, gives them very tough questions and they're allowed to talk. One of the, um, one of the more sort of uh, a tangent uh, of that and, and adjacent to that was when Lance Armstrong decided he was going to admit to doping. And he had every right to pick the jury, uh, and the jury was Oprah. He regrets that in hindsight, but 
he did it because he thought Oprah would be sympathetic and would just ask him questions and he would be able to answer and there wouldn't be a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Um, his other pick was Tom Brokaw. And in hindsight, he wishes Tom Brokaw would have done it. Um, but Lance's strategy was, I'm going to answer the questions. Nope, nobody's going to call me any names. Nobody's going to you know, smear me. And I'm going to get off the stage. You see how that went for him. It didn't go very well. But it was the beginning of a long, long period of sort of reconciliation with the public. And he wanted to do it on his terms. And there's a real role for that. We try to do that at the Wall Street Journal with video to make sure executives feel like they have a platform to just answer the questions and we don't have to get in the way with context and editing and you know partial quotes and paraphrases which always can be mis misconstrued yeah yeah I know. I hope not. I mean, so so if I get the question right, do do I think that the the, the ten year expiration point on on a new? Well, I hope not. I mean, this is. <laughs> Well, it's the power of, of, I mean, one of the hardest things for General Motors was to sunset o Oldsmobile. Beca not because Oldsmobile was this killer product line anymore, but because the power of the brand and its association with the American people. They couldn't afford it anymore, and, you know, they're very much a for-profit company. At the time, they weren't, but they were trying. And so um, the, the difference there is that there is, there is still, in my this is the thing that the bottom line that when you see the Wall Street Journal, when you see the New York Times, when you see the Washington Post, regardless of, of maybe the articles that you disagree with or you wish they would have been written differently, typically they have that currency of trust and that is the calling card. And hopefully there's value in that in the future. So Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Posts and really believes that you can, you, can, you can own other publications, you can own, you can start your own. I mean, Amazon's very good at shaking up and being disruptive. And they, they've disrupted everything from the way that we buy underwear to the way we you know, watch videos. But his view was, I need to have, in, in this space, I need to have a trusted name. And so what they've begun to do with Bezos' money is innovate the way that news is delivered. And I think that's, you know, we're all, and, and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal are trying to keep up. And so the trend is, is to say, well, I, we don't think that the brand names are going anywhere or the newsrooms are going anywhere. Um, but the way that it's distributed needs to change dramatically. And it needs to change pretty fast. Um, we're stuck in a world, though, where we're a newspaper that's trying to convince ourselves that we're not a newspaper. And so it's a really tough place to be because we still are a newspaper. We still organize ourselves for, as a newspaper. We still set the agenda. The most important stories go on the front page and so on and so forth. Most of these other publications that we're going against that are online don't think that way. They think in small tidbits. They think in you know three or four or five hundred word stories. They think in images. They think in things that can be tweeted. And so there is a conflict with with the way that we currently do business and the way we need to do business if that's going to change. So there's, I know firsthand, one of my best friends is in management at the New York Times, and they're working on the same things that we are, which is what the heck do we do to keep afloat and ma make some money to keep funding the kind of journalism that we're doing. You know, the Times won three Pulitzers, which is not the metric for, for everything, but it's still meaningful 
that even when they're challenged financially, as much challenge as they're, they're doing the kind of work that that rises above everybody else's and is seen as being worth, worthwhile a Pulitzer. So does that answer? I, I hope that the brands are strong enough that even with ownership changes and there's a, there's a bedrock foundation of the way that we do business that those things would never be diluted. And the New York Times is a good example because they have been through a qu couple of credibility problems where they've had journalists make things up and they've been able to withstand that pretty well. Um, so, uh, yeah. And the second part of that whole question is, is that uh, we seem to be going with apologies to Marshall McLuhan. Uh, <coughs> Right. Um, you know, there's two ways to look at it. I think one is that, yeah, th there's, there, there's two truths there. One is, and they're not in conflict, one is that people are consuming less in terms of the content. They're, they're not getting through the story. They're not going to the bottom. Um, okay, so we have to deal with that, and, and we need to write shorter stories and more impactful, and we need to sort of figure out ways to tell more stories over time. A lot of that's just a product of the fact that we've been consuming new, you know, news on TV for so long. And those are 30-second sound bites. And we have shorter attention spans. And that's just the kind of the evolution of the American mind and the, and the international mind. Um, but the other side of that is that folks are spending a lot of time. And we can track better than ever, as news organizations, how much time people actually do interact with the material. Because we know how long the web page is open before they move to the next web page. Um, and so the question was really about, you know, whether people are reading less, and, and this is a big problem. There's no doubt about it. We're getting so much of our information from our friends on Facebook, which we have good friends on Facebook, and they're nice people, but sometimes they're, they're not quite accurate or right. And, and neither is the media. The, we're not always right. We only have a, a smidgen of the information, and we do not have a monopoly on information. We do not have a, a monopoly on truth. But we try to, you know, we've always had this, this platform to be able to give a lot of the story. And the Internet in theory, should help us give even more of the story. Should say, hey, for more, for the stuff that we cut, go online. And that was kind of the thought in the beginning was, isn't this great? We're going to write 1,000 words for a paper audience, and then the rest of the world will get the 5,000 words. But nobody was going online and getting those 5,000 words. What is nice is, I think, is my journalism students are reading. It's just a question of what they're reading. And it's a question of what they're trusting. And that's the inflection point that I think we're at right now is, there's not, a, there's not a lack of appetite to consume stuff and to continue to take it in and to be informed, but there is a disruption in who the power players are in that category. And so for most of us in this room who grew up with traditional media sources, there, it, it's, it's scary. It is scary because there is this sort of uh, acceleration of, of, of companies and outlets that don't play by the sort of rules of Wal Walter. I'll uh, go to the back and I'll come back up. Well, let me let me just yeah. The the core question of the the core question of who the media is accountable to, right, and who I'm accountable to, um, is we're account There is a bit of the village concept here that we're accountable to each other. That good media will will bear out bad media, and that um, that there's a competitive there's increasing competitiveness in the in the institution institutional media. That um, if you're giving out bad information, people are going to turn you off. Okay, there's always going to be an outlet for conspiracies. There's always going to be an outlet for folks that have very radical ideas, um, and there's always there's protections for that. There's there's a there's a place for that, in fact, because sometimes from those things are spawned new ideas. Um, I mean, you know, 
uh, there was a day when, when anti-slavery thought was just a European concept and it was really a bad idea for America. So thankfully that radical idea was normalized. Um, but the lobbyists and the folks that are influenced by outsiders, um, you, this is where the issue of trust comes in and you say, I can only speak for the Wall Street Journal. I've never seen it, never seen it in our competitors. If anything, um, we don't work hard enough to provide content for our readers that they are expecting. So I, my, my, my bigger issue than the, the vulnerability of media to be corrupted or manipulated, I've seen it in the corporate world where it happens quite a bit, where company says X and writer writes X. Instead of writer takes it and makes the reader can go read the press release if they want. We're not there to turn a press release around for Hillary Clinton or Ford Motor Company or the Russians. Um, and so we do have to put our thinking caps on. The, the, the sad thing that's happened in this town is the Oakland Press has basically gone away. And the reason I refer to the Oakland Press is once upon a time we grew up reading a paper that was vibrant with dozens of reporters holding people like Brooks Patterson, for better or worse, accountable, or Kathy Dalton accountable, or the Rochester Library and all the, you know, the money that's hidden in the basement accountable. So <laughs> that is what we should, that's a big concern. Because the point that you're making is that these are big, powerful corporations that own these media uh, conglomerates. You're right. And that means that the shiny object, which is the international story, the national story, the conflict over health care, the conflict over tax reform, the conflict over gen, you know, gen, uh, equal gender bathrooms, uh, you name it the story du jour, the shiny object, typically is the thing that we're flooded with. So as producers of news, we're okay, because we've always got something to write about. As consumers of news, you're ripped off. And so, in, you know, what, what the, the, the job for the reporter is, and that you are not very empowered as a consumer of media to do much about it, unfortunately. Write your congressman sort of stuff. Yeah, right, my congressman really is gonna read my mail. Same thing about the journal, I mean, we, we print letters, um, but as an, almost as an exercise, there is, there's a bit of a, of a blinders on what people want to read and what we have traditionally delivered. Because if we only gave people what they wanted to read, sometimes the truth would get obscured. In the 21st century, folks are saying, you know, you've been given the platform. You've been given the access. Now do something with it. Work hard. Be the, be, be the scrutiny. Be the, be the voice of accountability. Uh, and most importantly with government, but also with these corporations and who, you know, are all well-meaning people, right? Nobody's out there to, you know, in the surface. But I would argue that the, the, the sad thing is that the big companies that bought the Oakland Press or provided patch to us or provided other organizations that were out there to hold more of the local media accountable are dissolving. I mean, the free press is just a sports page, sport, sports page now, and the rest is USA Today content or whatever the popular thing is. So um, the best work, though, I mean, the hope is, so with the Kwame Kilpatrick stuff, um, the Detroit Free Press broke that stuff. They won a Pulitzer for it. It's, the great, it's great stuff. And, you know, and we don't need to just go after our politicians for the sake of doing it. Our job is not to just kick people out of government and get CEOs fired and all this stuff. Our job is to hold people accountable and where there's smoke there, you know, is to chase the fire. And there's fewer and fewer resources to do that at the local level. Uh, there's a lot of resources to do that it, because there's a lot of money to be made in, you know, the Trump and the Russia and all of the big international stories, which is good and there's a place for that, but we have lost our touch with what's going on in our own backyard and how your tax dollars are being spent. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so the question is about artificial intelligence. Um, the biggest issue right now is that you can really begin to control, well, you and your provider can, can continue to narrow down what you see. So uh, you can either choose this by, you know, if, if any of you use Twitter for news primarily, Facebook for news primarily, uh, or Apple News, um, any news aggregator, Google News, Drudge Report, um, Drudge less so, but many of these sort of amorphous receptacles of information begin to say, what's your name? Bob. Bob. This is what Bob wants to read. This is what Bob cares about. Bob doesn't need to know about this, doesn't need to know about that, because this is where he's going to click, and the advertiser says, give me Bob. Give me Bob. Give me Bob. And so, 
uh, that's the that's the power of artificial intelligence in ter for you as a reader, uh, and it is a problem because people narrow down and they don't subscribe to publications that may have a wider view. Uh, we we subscribe in our home to publications that are you know not exactly within our slipstream of the politics, but we want our kids to kind of see there's a bigger world out there. Um, and the reason we do that is because there's fair points in every side. I mean, you kind of have to see both sides, right? And as a journalist, I guess I've learned that. But you, you see less and less of the other side or less and less of the world that you don't want to see. And that was the half an hour news broadcast, right? You'd go from start to end and you'd see the world. And some of the stuff you may not agree with, but you'd see uh, potpourri of stuff from weather to sports and everything else. And now increasingly, all I, I'm a Red Wings fan. All I want to hear about is the Red Wings and what they're going to do in the offseason. That's a little less potent than maybe you know, all I'm getting is a very skewed view of the world, and, and I'm not seeing the other side of the story, which is dangerous, right? So AI and writing, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I haven't seen it uh, on our level to play any role in, uh, in, in changing. I mean, it, the way it changes is news organizations that are traditional are becoming more and more worried about what, getting into that traffic jam of information. So we have to have saucier headlines, things that are clickable. We have to pursue news that we might not have because we want to get in that news aggregator. We want to be at the top of Apple News. And so where we may not have written ever, ever a story about uh, Taylor Swift, now we, you know, we're following some scandal because, man, people want to read about this stuff, right? So that's become the net effect of that is very respectable and traditional news organizations are increasingly paying attention to stuff that the readership and them, they just don't care as much about, but they know it's going to get them into the mainstream. And sometimes we'll even make that stuff free because we're like, our paying subscribers aren't going to pay to read this stuff, but, you know, everyone else will, and that will get us eyeballs and advertisers. Yeah, let's try to spread it out. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right, my, fact checking must le much less rigor than before. Uh, fact checkers don't exist much anymore. The editors are uh, few and far between. Well, the New Yorker has a reputation for it. So does Esquire and Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair and and anything that is sold on the rack with uh, with serious ten thousand, five thousand word feature length stuff. Um, stuff gets by them somehow. The Rolling Stone writes a story about a, incidents that never happen. <laughs> Uh, so it does happen. Uh, Stephen Glass, you know, at New Republic was very adept at evading fact checkers. Right. So at the Wall Street Journal, I'm, I, I'm the gatekeeper for the automotive coverage, so hopefully I'm seeing everything. Uh, it's not the norm in journalism these days to have kind of a gatekeeper for a certain public, you know, like CIA coverage, national security coverage, Supreme Court coverage. In Washington, we have five or six sub bureaus, and those ed there's editors over them, and they don't let anything out that hasn't been discussed, sources being discussed, balancing it out. Did you get a comment? I mean, that's kind of the stuff. I mean, the news business has always been fast moving. And sometimes you have to make judgment calls on the fly, like did Kennedy really get shot? And so once you can verify that we don't have any information except the president's been shot in Dallas, let's go on the air with it. And so we are in a very difficult spot in co competing in the 21st century, getting in the game with information as fast as possible. And that's where you have to have strong relationships between an editor and a reporter or a reporter who is really, really good and understands the, the contract that they have with the public, which is only what I know to be true. So you get it out there fast. Michael Jackson's died. We don't know why, but he's dead at the age of whatever. And so that information begins to build on more information, and the public gets frustrated. And that's where you have things like what happened in Newton a few years ago with the Sandy Hook shootings, um, with the brother being accused of being the killer instead of the guy who actually did the stuff. Because then you get this pile on. It's like a you know, high school or a, a elementary school where everybody begins piling on. And uh, inevitably, somebody's going to run with some bad information. And then it becomes fact. And then you have to undo that. So, in, in what we're reading on a daily basis, the stuff that's flying across us, a lot of it's not fact-checked. Um, and you are still seeing a lot more rigor on the New Yorkers on this side, but they are, they are backing away because the New Yorker is doing a lot more real-time information. So the New Yorker has a number of blogs, New Yorker is just an example, where it doesn't have the rigor that a New Yorker story in the print, and we, there's still this demarcation between print and, and web for a lot of these stories. 
that stuff will go away. Like, the New Yorker wrote it. Well, yeah, but the New Yorker reporter wrote it to your ears rather than having the sort of set of standards that they had in the past, right? So a lot more opinion seeps in, a lot less balance seeps in. Um, you're right, though. I mean, historically, the New Yorker was, was just reputed for, give me all your notes, give me all your phone numbers. We're going to re-report everything two times before we put it in the New Yorker, because that was the, the, the way that things were done. Yes? I'm an old schooler and like to get a newspaper and feel yeah. it in my hands or read it at my leisure. Um, but I've got to be a, a vanishing type of person. Just, yeah. um, I, I see a lot of this as you follow the money and people have a shorter, shorter attention span. Uh, they're not interested in whether it's factual or mm -hmm. you get hit with the talking heads all the time. Um, I just see this as a as a um, tornado going against the printed press, yeah. where uh, people are just turn on their turn on their smartphone mm -hmm. and, and get a thirty second blip, or they get one hundred and sixty characters, and and that's how they get their news. Yeah. And, and and it's gospel if they get it off their s smartphone, it's gospel. Right. And and then they're onto something else. And I see, like that gentleman said. 10 years, where are you guys going to be? Because people, you know, unless something happens in Washington yeah. and this whole thing turns around with the fake news and all of that, yeah. where are you guys going to be and where are we as consumers going to be? Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's careful. It's I don't know. I, I don't know about, I mean, I think people would have said 20 years ago, you know, that, you know, the, the world's going to, you know, this sort of world, yeah. gonna, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to the question and I'm not even going to try to figure out other than to say that, you know, printed newspapers probably won't be here to, to, to document whatever the heck well, has happened. Yes, yeah, dinner. I mean, that smartphone. I mean, look, I, you still, I, I read, I, I read the 10,000 word pieces in New York on my smartphone. You know, I, I don't, I don't have any patience for paper. So, and, and most people my age, I'm 40 and under, are the same way. It's just right. I don't want it. I, I don't. I don't start fires with it. I, you know, I get starter logs. So, I, I don't need paper. I, I'm, I'm so trained to sm swipe. My kids. I mean, my two-year-old knows how to use Elmo on, you know, call Elmo on my smartphone. So she's, she's got no use for it. And so. The, 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 the disintegration of the newspapers versus the disintegration of, of journalism is, it needs to be a fine line where we don't marry ourselves to, oh, newspapers are going away. We, this is just a receptacle for advertising. But is the smartphone equal to the newspaper? It can be. Yeah, yeah. I think people are more prone to kind of jump around because there's all kinds of options. It's just like a, a, a TV clicker, right? It's just right. you got your TV clicker, and if you don't like it, you're going to move on. Right. But... Uh, there's, you know, this is where education comes in. I mean, honestly, people are either educated and want to remain increasingly educated, or they don't. And so, I don't think it's much different than the, the conflicts that we've had for a long time, the crises that we've had, where people just don't want to be educated, or we're not working hard enough to educate people. The, 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 the medium is going to change. Right. You know, the medium is going to change. And, uh, and I, we, we're all resigned to that. We're just trying to figure out how to monetize the new medium. I'm going to just keep moving. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering is uh, when Sean Spicer has his daily yeah. conference. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Right. Which is no different than, than any, other, uh, any other press secretary in history. They've all had daily news conferences. Right. Yeah, let's be fair to Sean. This, this, this flood of reporters, yep. journalists, and Is there any criteria that To be in the room? Yeah, it's changed a bit in the last couple of years. A big moment was when the Huffington Post got a seat. And, and, and again, no, nothing against the Huffington Post. It was just an inflection point where a non-printed publication that has done some wonderful journalism and not so wonderful journalism over the years and has a very uh, identif identifiable founder, she, her, the publication got a seat because they became big enough and influential enough for the White House to say. Would Tyler or Brian please come to the check-in area Brian in and circulate? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Um, there is criteria. Uh, not every Johnny come lately with the blog gets in. Very true of most m uh, media invite things. Uh, press conferences, uh, just because you have a platform doesn't mean they're going to let you in. It's changing. 
the Trump administration has been criticized for being selective in which media they give access to. N again, no different than administrations in the past. If you upset Obama, you're going to pay a price. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a trade-off. Uh, and you know that, and it's a badge of honor. Hey, they didn't invite me. You know, it's not like the, the Wall Street Journal gets kicked out of the room. We're, 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 we're making big hay of that because it means we've done something right, you know. So, um, there, hopefully. Um, but yes, there is, there is an extreme criteria. There's a very institutional landed group. Um, and then we, as, as institutions, decide who the reporter is going to get in the room. Don't embarrass us. Don't wear your t-shirt. Don't, you know. And so typically, it is a, is a top level, top performing uh, journalist who will get the assignment. And sometimes they've been in there for decades. Yeah, Brian. Just as somebody who's been around, yeah. as long as you have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um, I, probably the quality of journalists coming out of, out of uh, in, into the profession. Um, it's uh, uh, very difficult to get people excited about the kind of journalism that'll change the world, and. Uh, it's a it's it's and and there's not a support system in the newsrooms anymore to to sort of take what hasn't been done at the college level and bring people up to the next level. And the reason I say that is not because Oakland University is doing a bad job of training journalists because we I've had my share of Harvard guys come in and I'm not kidding, lay a turd. And it's just it's a millennial thing or it's an it's just a mindset thing. Um, it's the view that. Journalism is kind of plays a, 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 an interesting role in society, but it, it isn't this bedrock foundation of the freedoms that we have. You know, we've done a great job of glorifying, and and and, and needless, need, there's a need for this. But servicemen and women get our highest esteem, which they deserve, for protecting our freedoms, for putting themselves in, in harm's way, for giving their lives, and by no means are journalists most of the time doing that. But we are protecting freedom the same way by holding accountable uh, the car company, the mayor, the, the person that's been elected with our trust, either by us paying them to keep us health, healthy or safe, the doctors. The, you know, this opioid crisis is a great example of just like Flint water. I mean, so there is a, a, a lack of infrastructure and a lack of competence uh, to, to, at the moment, to sort of breed another generation of Bob Woodward's, Carl Bernstein's. And I, OK, so that's my biggest challenge. I'm going to keep going with people I didn't get, then I'll get to the second folks that I, yes? If I, I have a lot of questions, yeah. if I could get two. Yep, two-parter. One, who gets to decide what ethics are? And is it going to be you? Is it yeah. going to be me? Is it going to be a consensus? Right. Walter Williams. Who gets to decide? It's, well, Walter Williams' ideas are not ubiquitous. I'll just say that. I mean, they're not widely, entirely embraced. Uh, they are a framework uh, within which uh, things have changed dramatically at many points. Or your, your microphone. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was just saying that you know the the question of Walter Williams is he deciding all ethics? Obviously not. Uh, it's not. There is not. There there is a bit of an evolving Hippocratic oath in the in the uh, in the journalism profession, which has to be fluid and has to change a little bit with the times. But there have to be bedrock ideas: fairness, objectivity, uh, the the right of somebody to respond to criticisms. You know, to avoid a lawsuit if anything else, or avoid getting thrown in jail, um, or costing your company millions of dollars. Um, when it comes to ethic, though. It should be on a story by story basis, right? So there's a lot of stories that just, you just write. I mean, you know, Tigers won today and Matt Boyd, you know, threw a two hitter or whatever. And, you know, those are just statistical. yeah, those are disclosure sorts of things. They happened. And we're trying not to insert too much into that. But, you know, the real hard research, the stuff that's going to, you know, be provocative, the stuff that's going to break news or, or, or change, change administrations, whatever it is, um, you know, really, uh, again, I think. The, all the President's Men deals with this spotlight. I don't know if you've seen spotlight. Deals with the amount of evidence that you need to gather, for instance, before you call the Catholic Church out on something as loaded as child abuse, right? Uh, the spot, has, anybody, has everyone seen spotlight? Like if you haven't, like it does a way better job than I've done. 
at explaining the profession and, and why we do what we do. Um, but you'll see in that story some, some real turning points where reporters are ready to go. We've, we've got the goods, let's go. And, and Marty Barron, who's the, you know, the managing editor of the Boston Globe, says not yet. You know, we need to understand the systematic issue here. And so typically newsrooms are organized with that hierarchy where you know, you've got these traps and the more important the story is, the more scrutiny. Lawyers will see much of what we do. Um, and, and when there's stories that are loaded, per, you know, stories that we know are going to lead to a bankruptcy, they're going to lead to a, co a company crumbling, they're going to lead to an economist losing his job. Those things are not ever treated lightly in much of the incumbent media. Um, but uh, sometimes, I mean, you do have to be pragmatic in the way you look at things. You know, you can't, just because it worked in one situation doesn't mean it's going to work in every situation that you apply the same logic. There are certain principles. You teach these to journalists, students. You tell them to take your book with you, take it in the newsroom. If in trouble, open page 35, and it should tell you some, some things that you do with the smell test. But there is a, there is a shared accountability. And there's also uh, an expectation that when you get it wrong, you're going to come back and say, we got it wrong. Now, sometimes that's too late, right? But yeah. All right, my second question is the falling man. Yeah. Um, in 1943, early, I believe, uh, several newspapers got together and petitioned and or sued the United States government mm -hmm. to show dead American soldiers hitting the beach yeah. in, the, in the desert. How have we changed from 1943 to 2001? So 1943, the government censored they were imagery. Yeah. Yeah. In, in 2017, I, I don't. I don't think any any newspaper. I think a newspaper that when in the United States, a news organization that would be in, even begin to s smell the government coming in and telling them what they can and cannot do would almost inspire them to do it in spite of good taste. Um, well, the ch what's, cha what's changed is, yeah. I think I think the public would show outrage with that. I think the public would react and say, well, I mean, it's you know, it's. There is no office of censorship today that comes in and says. But didn't you just say you self-censor? We self-censor. That image. That's right. The government, the, the the media. The, no, no. George Bush didn't call anybody on the phone. The Homeland Security didn't call anybody on the phone. Why would you self-censor that? Image? Because you start to say how much is too much for the Ameri for you know we need to in good taste and in the Amer in the public interest. Is there a reason to continue to show people committing suicide out of a building? Is there is this in the public interest and the family's interest? We do not identify rape subjects. Not because we're not allowed to, but because it is not in good taste to, to, to give the name of a person who's been raped. Should you also then, before conviction, give the name of the person who was accused? Um, differing opinions on that. Sometimes, no. Uh, and sometimes publications go way too far in, uh, in identifying somebody that has not been even accused of a crime. So yes, I mean, that's a very difficult and slippery slope. Um, the public does have a right to know, though, if somebody is, is a suspect of something. We should not, as papers, be trying to identify who that is unless uh, it's some unsolved, some unsolved crime or there's a, there's, a, there's a compelling narrative reason behind it. Did Bush uh, embed, embed the uh, term embedment in the uh, Iraq war? Embedment? Yeah, in other words, the reporters were embedded. In, reporters being embedded? Huh? Embedded reporting? In, in uh, I don't know if it was Bush. I mean, I, I don't know the George answer. George H. Yeah. Oh, uh, 41. I mean, that's, that's, that's yeah. a form of censorship, and I can understand it in, in more time. Well, it feels to me more like that's a, a, a democratization of what was going on, and actually to show show people this is what actually happens in war, because it has been, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Embedding a, a yeah. reporter in means you're actually allowing the reporters yeah. to write. Now, now, there will be certain conditions to the embed. There will be things that are off limits that you do not write about. Okay, you agree. This is off the record. You're not going to show this. This is these are the conditions of your access. That's nothing new. I get time with Trump. Thirty minutes is on the record, and fifteen minutes is off the record. That's my decision to say if you're going to go off the record, I'm walking out. Or you can tell me what's off the record. That's nothing new. But the embed is actually something that's been, I think, far more effective to the American people seeing how your taxpayers are being ta ta tax money is being spent and how the military functions. Yes. What kind of stories did you cover overseas? Um, everything. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. I covered uh, the Latvians uh, in the wake of Ukraine and that they were very sympathetic to the Russians because there's a lot of ethnic Russians in Latvia. I had no idea. I didn't even know where Latvia was before I went overseas. So that was the kind of cool thing. I covered the Pope. Like I said, that was a lot of fun, the, 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 uh, the conclave in 2013. My family went with me, so we were all sitting in Rome during that whole time, and we got the, 
tour the Sistine Chapel. Um, the emergence of a lot of tech companies who have Spotify, that's from Sweden. Uh, a lot of the games that your kids and grandkids play, uh, my kids play, are from Sweden. So we, I did a lot of stories on kind of why there are such innovators in kid space, and Minecraft is from Sweden, and H&M and Ikea. We all love Ikea. Companies like that. Um, did blew the lid off of things that Americans just didn't know about. Like, if you're if you're uh, if you're on maternity leave in Sweden, you get 450 days of maternity leave, split between your the two parents, and your if you're going to take the benefit, uh, you either have to take none or take all. So I had people that would be like, see you next year. <laughs> so we did stories like that. We did stories on the latte dads. Uh, the latte dads were the guys that took six months off, and then came back to their jobs and were like, all right, I'm here to pick up on my uh, old job. Um, we did, I did stories on Anders Breivik, who was the uh, guy who killed 77 Norwegian kids, mostly kids, in uh, 2012. I uh, interviewed him. Um, I was there for his sentencing. Uh, I did a lot of stories in the wake of that, how that affected Norway and their psyche. I um, did stories on sort of the collapse of the Euro in Finland and how that affected them. Uh, so yeah, a wide divergence. We did stories on the central bank in Iceland, uh, suicide in Greenland, oil, oil patch in Greenland, natural resources, you name it, all over the place. It was a very diverse spot because we're much uh, lower resourced in places like, for good reason, Stockholm than we would be in Detroit. So, now, um, did you get sent there? Or did you um, I was asked to go, and then I was like, yeah, we'll do that. You know, we we didn't know much about it, so we kind of took it as an adventure. Um, I had left the paper for a while in order to come back. They sent me to Sweden. They're like, this is your, it wasn't a bad punishment at the end of the day. I didn't go to Iceland, but I had many reporters go. My niece is there for the third time. Oh, oh yeah, people swear by it. Yeah, yeah I didn't go. I, why, why I didn't go? I went to Rome. I took the Rome trip in March rather than Iceland. Yes? Um, I have a question related to Spotlight. Yeah. Um, right. Um, I mean, uh, there's a con there's two things. There's, is there still going to be money for spotlight type of reporting? This was in 2002, uh, or patience, right? Yeah, well, so the patience is a big factor. So guys and gals who are responsible for that kind of journalism are increasingly seen as the dinosaurs who still read the paper. Um, and what have you done for me lately kind of expectations on journalism are uh, journalism is killing that kind of in-depth resource driven journalism if you watch that movie the meticulous i mean the thing about bob woodward and, and carl bernstein was there was a lot of action i mean it was story upon story upon story front page story it was so fast moving it all began with a with this break in in the trial um or the the the, the five guys being brought into court um this was one where they began to, that being the, the Catholic Church thing had been going on for years, and they had come back into it, right? And they had ignored it for years, and they had written small, short stories. And so there was a, the, the journalists wanted to get it out there because they were afraid of getting scooped. And in that case, and one of the reasons Marty Baron is sort of seen as like a modern day Ben Bradley is he said, wait, you know, we're going we're gonna to do this right, and we're going to make sure we've got the entire narrative. So the money and the patience are limited. In this day and age, um, it's still being done. I'm on a couple of award committees where we judge some of this work, and you still see it. Um, uh, and, a, and the good news is, uh, one of the Pulitzer uh, winners was a small town paper that has like 3,000 people in their town. So it's it's on every level, but it, it is about the newsroom philosophy, and it's also about setting aside those resources. So we have at the Wall Street Journal and New York Times specific investigative teams. We went to work after the Tesla crash last summer where a guy unfortunately lost his life on an autopilot in a Tesla. We spent months piecing together different things to try to write in that vein. I'm going to get one more from the back. Yep. Yeah. I've experienced both. Yep. I, so the American media is. And, and I'm not saying this because I'm a member of the American media, is trusted exponentially more than most foreign uh, medias, uh, local medias. And I experienced this first when I was in the auto industry, and I was always scratching my head. Now, this is not, a, this is not BBC and some of the major international outlets, but on the local scene, um, you would not say the things about the Detroit News that the locals said about their papers in Stockholm. I, I kid you not, I, and some of you have lived in Europe and maybe experienced this, or you're in the auto industry and you see some of the stuff that some of these local outlets put out, and everyone's like, Pfft. 
it's Dagen's industry. You can't uh, trust a word you say. And it, it's like, I mean, that was so foreign to me. Like, everybody knows this? Yeah, no, you, they just write whatever they hear. And they're like, it's just hearsay. We're not even going to follow it. And we had this international publication, and I'm thinking, we should be following what the local media is doing. No, 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 no. And it was, it, I mean, there are papers in town that people trust and they don't trust, but there is, a, there, that's a big value for, we haven't gotten to, to the point where it's easy to make money on this, uh, but if the Wall Street Journal is writing about you in Stockholm or Japan, or it's a whole nother level. Now there are competitive publications and there are regional differences. Um, the Nikkei in Japan, uh, you know, I mean, they're just region by region, but I, I, my view, my thus far has been in, in terms of the uh, traditional American media often gets far more credibility and respect, particularly overseas. The New York Times is, is gospel. And uh, so. Your attention, please. The library will close in 30 minutes. The Guardian, yes, Continue but the Guardian's taking cards, some hits. Yep, they're taking some hits. Desk on the first floor. Right. Well, the, we don't need, I mean, there, there's not a huge consumption of international media in the United States. The it is, Thank you. There is a bigger consumption overseas from my experience. when I. When I was in Rome and when I was in all, my, many of the uh, states that I was in, in the Nordics. I think that's it. DJ, right? One more question. Oh, one more. Tommy, yep. I, we were looking for people that he sold cars to. Yes. And when? 1993. Okay, you still have it? <laughs> okay. He's a good guy. The, the comments, comments aside, I, you'll never find a person to say a bad thing about my dad. And th he does it right. Right? Okay. Well, the only question is why you didn't buy another one from him. <laughs>